guys. Great job. That was an awesome set. Many instruments, much religious humor, which I appreciate. Um, so I couldn't help but notice the remark about the nun, learning the guitar from the nuns. Is there any truth in this? Yeah, there is. So some of you maybe uh, have had heard about or maybe experienced firsthand Vatican II, which is where Pope John the Twenty Third determined that nuns could be groovy. <laughs> And in the wake of that, evidently nuns picked up guitars and stopped wearing the flying nun garb and began playing what is still called, I guess, the folk mass in church. And so Sister Marie Claire changed my life and the life of many children in Manchester, Iowa, by teaching guitar lessons. And my first public performance was at the age of five with a guitar around my neck singing, It's a Small World After All. While singing It's a Small World After All, my guitar tuning peg, one of the pegs, the entire class was singing with me, the entire first grade class was singing with me. The guitar peg managed to get stuck in Ann Lammer's ponytail. And so my first lesson in stage presence was to continue to sing. It's a world of laughter, it's a world of tears, while removing the guitar peg from the ponytail of Ann Lammer's. This is a true story. It's true. At least, if that hadn't happened, you probably would not remember your first time performing. Yeah, it made a certain, added a certain intensity to the. So, yeah. after that, what happened as a performer? <laughs> what, uh, when did you get serious and, and really start to look for audiences and make records? And, and had you moved to Chicago by then? No, I, I got a. I got an undergraduate degree in voice from the University of Iowa and then a master's in voice from Temple University in Philadelphia. And I thought I was going to sing opera, but I, I just wasn't loud enough. Was the real truth of it. I simply wasn't, I mean, it just, I really, Oh, mio bambino caro. Well, that's, you know, this is amplified. Okay, wait, yeah, yeah. But that's amplified, right? I mean, the women who do it for a living sing the big, your and, yeah, blast your head off. And I was an underachiever. And so I, I picked up my guitar and started writing songs again, and people said, hey, that's real good. Do more of that. Nice. So I did more of that. How many records have you made? Gosh, 438. You're really, seriously, like eight or nine, yeah. Right. And um, tell us about the most the most recent. I didn't come up here totally brief, but just uh, so you can plug plug the product. What's well, the, the most recent. I'm happy to talk about the most recent project because I did it here in Nashville. Yeah. At, at Omni at Omni Sound Studios right downtown, um, and Rodney Crowell produced it, and um, we did it in August. Of last year, Brian. O I know that these guys are, might be listening. Just driving around town. Brian Owens played on it. Victor Krause played on it. Um, Paul Franklin, the lap steel genius, played on it. Uh, had the good fortune to have my friend Kevin. Kevin Mo played on it. Vince Gill stopped in, and um, it was really a charmed two weeks of music making. It was a real honor. And Nashville is a great place to make a record and play music because people really do honor a song that has storytelling in it. Right. They really do. They really listen for the thread of a narrative in a song. And if you can do that, you, your welcome couldn't be warmer. Yeah, people will play solos based on, they want to know the lyrics, they want to know how the song's about it. Yeah, Braves. that's right. And even Brian Owens, the drummer who played on the session, he always asks for a copy of the lyrics. The drummer asks Only for the Nashville. lyrics. Only in Nashville. Only in Nashville, that's right. How did you, how did you get uh, connected with Rodney Crowell? That's neat. Um, I met him through a mutual friend and who sent him the songs that I was working on, and um, Rodney was so kind. and. He said, you know, your ballads are your fastball. He said, your ballads are your, are your best songs, which kind of stunned me. I mean, people are always looking for radio or the wow, but he's like, no, you're, you know, your your quiet songs are really the most powerful. Right. And so he encouraged me to really invest in those on this record. Well, the green light song, which I hate, but uh, I want to ask about about your uh, your home base now, Chicago, because it's a city I love. It's got great musical traditions. It's a great city. And uh, some of you reminded me a little bit on stage of, of the great Steve Goodman. Hey, thanks for saying that. That means a great deal. Storytelling Thank you. presence. He was a real force. Yeah. What's what's going on there now that, that that you kind of connect with and that you feel like how would you how would you uh, sell the scene uh, as it were right now? It's always a political city. I mean, it's always a, a, a city of people who stay indoors and read and write, and they value what you write. They value what you have to say. They expect you to get up and speak straight from the heart. And if you do, just like Steve Goodman, they respond really. I mean, that's that's what it's all about. And we'll deal with the Cubs at a later date. We can't. Don't even speak about it. Right. <laughs> well, folks, I think we better keep moving on. So I'm going to say goodnight to, to, to Susan Warner, and thank you for being here very thank much. You. Thank you. All our time. All right.
On the table 